I'm not sure that you could pay me enough to get me to uh, write a script for for Hollywood because of the all the stories I've heard. Even when things go well, you know, even if, if you happen to get a really good script and they make a really good movie out of it, it's just hell. And uh, you know, it's like if anyone ever people ask me, oh, if if they want to make a movie out of one of your books, do you want to write the script? No, I don't. I don't. I'm gonna take the option money and uh, and and stick with prose. Pat Cadigan, the queen of cyberpunk, returns to the Plutopia podcast as we discuss her novelization of William Gibson's screenplay for Alien 3. Gibson's version was never used in the final film, but Pat was asked to do a novelization approved by Gibson and hailed in reviews as far better than the movie. Hey everybody, welcome to another Plutopia podcast. And today we're welcoming back Pat Cadigan, the steam science fiction author, uh, especially in the cyberpunk subgenre, often referred to as the queen of cyberpunk. Actually, you know, the Guardian newspaper here in, in the UK gave me that title. Well, so I thought it, that, I mean, I thought that that was acknowledged globally. Well, I'm sure that it is, but, you know, <laughs> first, they were the first actually who, to say it they had the most courage so <laughs> i remember when i first met you you were wearing like black leather yeah probably or some such so um we're here today uh as a follow-up we we did another interview a month or so ago but uh today we're going to be talking about the recently released novelization of alien three ah uh. A book very, very dear to my heart because it, uh, it, it checks off one of the items on my bucket list, which is do a duet with William Gibson. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that raises an interesting question. Were you in touch with Gibson while you were writing the book? Did he have well, any input? Well, actually, um, he, we are in touch. And he knew that he was, you know, welcome to give me any input on anything at any time. But this was something that he did maybe 30 years ago. And, uh, and I, I'm not telling any tales out of school. This is, he, he gives this account in the introduction to the um, uh, graphic novel from, from Dark Horse about this. This was work for hire for him. He did two drafts of his of the script by request. And then the studio said, okay, thank you. Um, and he found out later that actually they never intended to produce the script that he wrote. They just wanted something written in the cyberpunk style. And then they were going to give it to a writer of their own to basically rip off. And they ended up giving it to several writers of their own, right? Weren't there several well, people on that script before they really finally know, ruined it? Most people know know the story. I really don't, you know. And um, I, I think it was because right around the time Alien 3 came out, uh, what year was that anyway? Jeez, uh, I'd have to look, but I don't mind looking. It was early, early 90s, wasn't it? Mid nineties, maybe. It was uh, nineteen ninety two. Nineteen ninety two, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was really really busy. I had um, I had two novels under contract, and uh, one had just come out, and uh, I I think I was doing. I, I I may have been doing like wrapping up corrections on the second one, the one that had just come out. No, it came out the, the the year before in ninety one. That was Sinners, oh, yeah. and and uh, yeah, and Fools was was due out, I think in ninety three. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, it 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 got delayed until ninety four, but anyway, um, uh, so I was I was kind of all wrapped up in in my own work, and 
I was, you know, I knew that there was going to be a third Aliens movie, but uh, uh, I wasn't so terribly invested in the franchise that I was I was reading a lot of information about it because uh, uh, aside from the, uh, the, the two books uh, that I was handling, there was also, um, uh, you know, the young child, the young school age child. And uh, I remember when Sinners came out, I found my son, uh, he was five years old and he was sitting on the couch looking at it. He was trying to read it. And I said, honey, I, I, I think that, uh, that that's kind of a grown up book for you to try reading. And he looked up at me and said, yeah, mom. And you use the F word a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, my, my kid had, had some, some degree of reading. But anyway, <laughs> um, I, I didn't know very much about, uh, about aliens. And the only time I first knew that, that Bill had somehow been involved. In fact, I, I sort of took it for granted that they might contact him to, to write an aliens movie for no reason other than, you know, I thought it was likely. And uh, he said that um, they kept the barcodes that he'd written in, you know, the, the prisoners have barcodes on the backs of their necks. And he had, I guess, written barcodes into one of the drafts. And he saw that it was one of the things that they had kept. Um, and I, I don't know where, where I read this or heard it or found out about it, but one that of the was, few things, the, really. Well, that was the, the first time I knew. You sure. know how when you yeah. when you Google something um, at the top of the search engine results, there will be something that says people also ask. And then there's a few questions yeah. after that that are related. And if you Google Alien 3, it gives you as the top question, why was Alien 3 so bad? <laughs> and the response, which is from Wikipedia, says it was the rushed product of too many story conferences and in interference with no time to write and turned out utter crap. And I think that they're quoting somebody there. I'm not sure who. But, um, you know, I think so Gibson wrote a really good script. And then they well, just he wrote started two versions of the script. Two I versions. Yeah. Had the first draft. And Dark Horse Comics made the graphic novel out of the second draft. And they're really quite different, very quite different stories. So, you know, if you've read the Dark Horse comic, you have not read, you know, you've not read the novelization that I wrote. There's so not... the, the, in the novelization you wrote, the, the protagonist, the real focus is on Hicks. Ripley's out of the picture, Newt's out of the picture, you've got Hicks. Uh, that second script was that the same way, or did he bring Ripley yeah. back into they, it? They had told they had told Bill that uh, uh, Ripley was a non-starter. They didn't want her in the movie, and uh, Bill thought that was too bad because Ripley was his favorite character. But his second favorite character happened to be uh, Bishop, and uh, it was funny because uh, apparently he and I had the same first and second best favorite characters and I felt the same way but I would find out until of course I read the the intro to the golf, the graphic novel I was wondering um the whole um, involvement of the movie people in changing the you know, the whole course of uh, the alien story uh, not, it's not uncommon because Jeff uh, had friends that were involved in getting things, uh, uh, submitting scripts, you know, to to movie producers, uh, particularly back in that time, the '80s and '90s, and it seemed like they had a total disconnect with reality. That uh, you know, some of the scripts that I read, my friends submitted to, who, who had had other things, you know, used in movies, and you know. It was marvelous, and the stuff that came out was just horrible. And you know, it seems like uh, that was what happened to Gibson. Is you know, he was too good for uh, too good for Hollywood. You know, I'm not sure that you could pay me enough to get me to uh, write a script for for Hollywood because of the all the stories I've heard. 
even when things go well, you know, even if, if you happen to get a really good script and they make a really good movie out of it, it's just hell. And, uh, you know, it's like if anyone ever, people ask me, oh, if, if they want to make a movie out of one of your books, do you want to write the script? No, I don't. I don't. I'm going to take the option money and, uh, and, and stick with prose. You know, getting back to the absence of Ripley in, in this particular version of the story, my guess was that they were having trouble getting Sigourney Weaver to agree to come back. So they asked for a script that omitted her and that at some point they finally got her to agree. And that required them to completely rewrite the thing so that Ripley was at the center of it. But that's yeah. just speculation on my part. It, it, it seems to make sense. Yeah. The only thing I know for certain is that Bill was told that Ripley would not be part of it. So, um, so that was the story that he wrote. And um, Bishop is Bishop is a great character. Oh yeah, but he really does have to be a supporting character because um, I mean, as as obviously sentient as he is, and possibly conscious, you know. Um, it's still asking a bit much for, you know, uh, an artificial person, you know, to carry the entire book or be the focal point. Um, I didn't mind using Hicks. Hicks was wonderful. And uh, I mean, I got a real sense of, you know, Hicks, Hicks being a human, real human person. And uh, one of the reasons that I loved the alien movies, alien, the first movie, and then aliens. And I, I couldn't put my finger on it for a long time because of course the, there are plot holes, you know, and that usually drives me nuts, but I loved the movies anyway. And I finally, I finally realized I loved them because uh, it may have been the first time in my life when I saw men and women uh, together on the screen really acting like equals you know the the marines are you know they're just they're just absolute there isn't that you know that sexism that you usually find yeah exactly and i i think a lot of people respond to that and so you could have you know if if more of the marines had had uh survived the the thing on you know at the end of, uh, of the second movie, I would have felt fine with, um, you know, uh, telling the story of the viewpoints of any of them because they were, uh, they were so, they were so people, if you get what I mean. And you did come back to them from time to time in Hicks' memories of them. Well, you know, I understand a fair amount about combat soldiers. Uh, when I was a teenager, I used to go and uh, a friend of mine had a had a a friend of his who was uh, in a VA hospital after having seen action in Vietnam, and I used to go with my friend to visit his friend, and um, even if you don't come out of a combat situation with you know a terrible injury or a life-changing injury, you are still haunted by the conflict and by, you know, what you've seen happen. And when you see all your, you know, all your, the, the, your brothers and sisters, basically, you know, people that are even closer to you than your own family, at least for that period of time, and they die, you know, you feel the loss and particularly, um, uh, when Hicks was a corporal, but he ends up, you know, in command and, and, you know, losing everyone in the command, you know, it's like, there's only one thing worse than dying with your squad. And that's being the only one left. Yeah. And I, I felt that, that, you know, he had the kind of humanity who wouldn't, he wasn't just an action figure, you know, and he would be haunted by all of those people 
I had a roommate years ago that had just come back from Vietnam and uh, he had actually, I think he had stepped on <clears throat> an explosive device and, and been injured himself, but he, he made it, he made it through and he was yeah. basically okay. But uh, he talked uh, a bit about, uh, he always referred to him as his buddies and about having a buddy like killed right next to you shot in the head or something like that. And of course that had been a traumatic experience for him, but on the one hand you have like the trauma and, and the, and the difficulty of losing people that are close. But on the other hand, you have the kind of band of brothers thing where you feel this close kinship with the others and, and whoever survives they're they're like friends for life and so forth. Yeah. So. Well, also there's the extra uh, aspect of them being Marines. Um, Marines are, you know, Marines are amazing people, you know, in that uh, <laughs> I salute anyone who could get through Marine boot camp, you know, but um, there's actually no such thing as an ex-Marine. I got that, and, yeah. And, uh, and, and that's how they are. And so I, I pretty much used what I knew about the military and, and what I knew about Marines and and applied it here there you know i i felt it would be it would simply be wrong to have uh to have hicks you know bouncing around and like like you know he just popped out of uh, a new box from the showroom floor yesterday and him not be affected by the you know by by his experience and he had to draw on what he knew of the aliens you know what he already knew and then he had to find out of course that what he knew was out of date yeah because the aliens were you know evolving and adapting right before his eyes well that was an interesting thing about the book uh in the previous aliens films the alien was uh was not evolving in that same way but you have this sort of like constant mutation going on. It's like the alien is a, a, a virus of sorts. You know, it's like a large virus. Yeah. Did, yeah well, it, was that Bill, in the original script or, or is yeah, that something you added? No, that's the way Bill wrote it, you know. And uh, anything I added was simply to, uh, to underscore that idea. And that the bit of, at the end where, you know, Bishop tells Hicks, you you have to respond to these creatures uh as a species and hicks says well we'll just have to stay out of their way and and bishop says no you can't do that they are you know they are your enemy and the universe isn't big enough for both of you and that's the way um that's the way that the bill wrote the story well your treatment of the uh, the enlisted personnel from the Marines was quite different from the, your treatment of the commanders, you know, particularly uh, the, the main character that was uh, falling apart. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, that uh, is very much in line with what my experience has been encountering, you know, military people, Marines, you know, having lived in the Bay Area, you know, I got to know a lot of people that were stationed there. And that was yeah. generally their experience. But your treatment of the company was quite interesting. Did you model that after any real world companies or um, operations? It was very you know, unflattering to the company. <laughs> well, well, very, very sort of vaguely. I grew up uh, in, uh, in, a, in a town in uh, north central Massachusetts called Fitchburg. And there was a military installation nearby, Fort Devons. And kids from Fort Devons would, you know, went to our schools and everything. And sometimes they'd be around for several years. And sometimes they'd, they'd be in and out within the same year. And uh, just, you know, I remember hearing them talk about, uh, you know, what, what it was like having, you know, your father, it was usually the father in the military. And sometimes uh, guys who were stationed at Fort Devons didn't have their their families on the base. Uh, they would they wanted them, you know, in a regular home, so that when they went home, you know, to to be at home, they weren't still on the base. 
So we had in, in my apartment building, there occasionally we would have, you know, an army wife who, you know, with a small baby usually or small children. And I just would, you know, pick up things uh, from them. So I think that was, you know, part of it is remembering Fort Devens and the and the people who lived there. I, I'm really interested in kind of how you got into this. What, uh, how did how did you get the project in the first place? Um, I think I was chosen because uh, I was the queen of cyberpunk. You know, it's like Gibson and Cadigan together again for the first time. Uh, I was offered the project by uh, in, by Titan US as opposed to Titan UK. And uh, uh, the editor was Steve Saffel, and uh, and he offered it to me, and I said, "Oh, thank God, you offered it to me." And uh, yes, I'll take it. And I jumped on it. So once you get the uh, get the project, kind of, how do you approach it? Did you have access to other scripts, or did you just get a copy of Gibson's? Well, as I understand it, I guess the script was there are scripts that are available online and Steve had mentioned that there there was another script and he wanted to hunt that one down at the time you know it's like I didn't know it but he was talking about the script that the um the, the Dark Horse comic was based on and I guess he didn't know it either but he kept saying I, I keep getting messages from him while I was working on the on the novel and he'd say, I, I think I've got a lead on it. I might have something next week. But of course, this went on and on from uh, the time I got the assignment in March until October. And he found the second script in October and he sent it to me. And I looked at it and I didn't read it because I immediately recognized it as the graphic horse, uh, graphic horse, dark, dark horse, horse, graphic yeah. novel. And so I, um, I, uh, I told I told Steve this, and originally when we had begun the project, he said, I don't want you to take anything from the Dark Horse graphic novel. And I said, no, I would never do that. That's somebody else's work. So, um, but he had been talking about how if he found the second script and he thought that, you know, we should try and incorporate that material, what would I do? And I said, well, you know, I'm under contract to, to do the writing. I'll change it if, I, if, if that's what I have to do. But as it turned out, you know, we didn't do that. And uh, it really wasn't possible because uh, the thing is, there, uh, there are a lot of the same names between the two scripts, but the story is, the story is really different. I mean, about as different as it can be when you have the basic plot is uh, a uh, an alien, a xenomorph gets loose on a space station and kills everybody. Yeah, and starts reproducing and mutating and yeah. so forth. Yeah. So there, I know there's like there's a bunch of other novels. Uh, there's a whole literary franchise, alien novels, and there's comic yeah. books and there's games and all that. It sounds to me like you didn't really take time to look at any of that stuff but that you stayed pretty focused on the 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 gibson script that you were working with right well the thing is bill wrote the script before there there it even really was a franchise there were two movies and uh it, it was wide open from there no one was was thinking in terms of uh this is the canon or this is the bible or anything so i i stuck strictly with with Bill's script because I read it and I really really liked it and I I and, and Bill's Bill's a friend of you know close to 40 years yeah and I wanted to honor my friend and and also uh do good by him because he he is you know such a great writer anyway and uh, so I wanted to honor a friendship. I wanted to honor him as a, as a colleague. And uh, I wanted to, uh, to be faithful to his vision as much did as Did you I diverge could. in any way? Did you have things that you did that really weren't in the script, but you thought were kind of essential as you wrote well, it? Well, 
there are always a number of things that you have to put in when you do a novelization because one picture really is worth a thousand words. So what you can do on screen in one second with lighting, background music, and facial expression will take you about a thousand words in, in, in text. And there are some things that don't work in, in a text, in a prose on the page uh, that will work in a movie. But the, the biggest changes I made were to the, um, were to the cast of characters. I made them more inclusive, more women, more people who weren't white. And uh, when, when Bill wrote, you know, the, uh, the story back then, even in the, you know, the, the second alien movie, the aliens with the, with the you know, the, the Marines, there, there were, you know, uh, it wasn't sexist, but there, there wasn't anything like gender parity, you know, there were very few women and it was dominated by men and the women all but one disappeared fairly quickly, except for, you know, Ripley and, uh, and uh, Newt and Vasquez. So um, I, and, and I, you know, I filled in a little backstory here and there. Um, uh, at one point, um, Newt is going home to her, to her grandparents and uh, uh, they managed to find them and, and, and Hicks thinks, well, you know, if they hadn't, if, if they hadn't been able to find any family for her, he'd have talked to his sister Zelda about, you know, taking her. Well, there's no sister mentioned, you know, in anywhere in, in Hicks's backstory. So that was something I threw in, but, uh, it seemed to me that, you know, Hicks was so attached to her and so conscious of duty that he would make sure that, you know, she landed somewhere safe, uh, no matter what he had to do. And I guess we, we talked a little bit earlier about how you, at the time, Alien 3 came out, you didn't <clears throat> see it. Did you watch it as you were working on this novelization? Oh, I eventually did see it. You know, mm -hmm. I wasn't paying much attention, but I eventually saw it. And uh, I was appalled. I mean, there are people who do like this movie. And, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's, I'm glad everybody is able to like what they like and not like what they don't like. But uh, I was appalled at, you know, just the waste of, of Newt and Hicks and Bishop, you know, for the most part. Really? Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, Ripley was basically reduced to, you know, a, uh, a victim to rape. And I understand that, yeah, they landed on a planetoid of, you know, all men, and it had been a prison planet, you know, full of murderers and rapists and everything. But, um, uh, you know, it didn't have to be. It didn't have to be a planetoid of, of you know, it didn't have to be a prison planet. I suppose that, you know, that adds a certain amount of, you know, extra menace. But, um, uh, and the other thing was, was when uh, Ripley decides to distract the doctor uh, by having sex with him, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, I didn't, I mean, Sigourney Weaver pulled it off very naturally, but it seemed to me out of character. It, I thought it so too. Very, I mean, I, th I thought the whole movie was kind of odd. I mean, I, I saw it when it came out and didn't like it very much then, but I went back and watched it again, you know, sort of prep for this interview. Uh, in fact, I watched Aliens and Alien 3 and Aliens is so much better than Alien 3. And I think the spirit of aliens is carried forward much better in, in the Gibson script and in your novelization than in that weird movie that they actually produced. Well, what Bill, Bill also mentions, I think, in the introduction to the Dark Horse graphic novel, that uh, 
he was a big Aliens fan. So he did his best to write a, a great Aliens movie when, you know, what they were looking for was um, lots of chrome and, and mirror shades and, and things like that. So, um, and, and I was a big Aliens fan. I, th I think a lot of us were. And a lot of us identified as, as cyberpunks were probably, you know, very, very fond of, of aliens because uh, it, it had a cyberpunk spirit to it. You know, it's like the cyberpunk spirit to me was, no, the future is not going to be bright and shiny just because we invent stuff or we develop technology. Um, you know, and, and I can tell you this myself, you know, my first computer, I brought it home. I set it up and my, my monitor went out. <laughs> I had to call the computer store and they came and got it and replaced it. But it was so stupid, you know. And to me, that's, you know, that's one of the things cyberpunk said. You know, people are going to, people aren't going to use all the bright, shiny technology for, you know, the most virtuous of, of goals. And that's if, if it even works right, you know. So to me, um, Aliens was the kind of, uh, it kind of had that spirit to it. You know, it's like the, the Marines think that they're going to go in and they're going to rescue everybody. And they end up, you know, they, the, half of them die, you know, just, just walking in the door. So, um, so I felt that, uh, I, you know, I probably had a point when I started this, this soliloquy, but um, I've uh, I've lost it in my own eloquence. God, this happens. It's it's a function. You know what? I'm blaming Timo Brain. I, I I haven't had Timo since 2015, but I'm blaming it anyway. Oh, I think we all encounter <laughs> some of those lapses. I'm, you know, at, at my age, it's uh, well, it's a daily kind of thing. I have to admit, I I still haven't watched Alien Three. Because when I heard that uh, they had rejected William Gibson, I figured, well, <laughs> that kind of explains what kind of people are doing that movie. So I've had better things to do with my time. But I it's love hard to watch. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the reports I got from other victims of the movie uh, <laughs> were similar. But I, I loved your treatment of the company. And uh, I was fascinated by that because it's so much like you know, the way the, especially the United States uh, 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 military industrial complex has uh, handled, you know, weaponizing things you know, like the internet and <laughs> a lot of other things. Uh, what was your inspiration for that company? Oh, the Wayland Yutani? Yes. Oh, well, that's, that's kind of an existing thing already. And, um, uh, in Bill's script, uh, he makes, you know, they make a big deal out of, oh, it's the company, you know, it's Will and Yutani. And they are like all powerful and, you know, they've got their hooks and everything. And the, uh, the, the characters, uh, weaponized Barbie and Ken, you know, they were, they were Bill's invention. I, I invented weaponized Barbie and Ken for them, but, you know, that's because Bill never played with Gar Barbie dolls, and I did. And uh, people who are, you know, just really company people. Um, remember, I worked for 10 years for Hallmark Cards, and I met a lot of hard, hard line, hardcore company people in that time. So um, I, I guess I, I based some of it on my experiences with, uh, with a large corporation. And, you know, it's like, I'm not, I'm not singling Hallmark out for, for any kind of criticism at the time that I worked there. Actually, it was a very good place to work, but uh, a large corporation is a large corporation. And when you come down to it, you know, there is, there is nothing that a large corporation is dedicated to more than its own survival. You know, there's a, we were talking about how horrible the Alien 3 movie was, but there's actually a, a different version of the Alien 3 movie that's 30 minutes longer. It's called the Assembly Cut or Special Edition. 
and hmm. apparently it's somewhat better. Apparently they did some work on it that made it better than the original. Uh, I have not seen the assembly cut and, and I'm kind of interested now in seeing it, but I think a couple of things that are missing that I really miss in, in that version of the movie and the script. One is um, in, in Gibson's version and your novelization, you have this capitalism versus like communism, socialism thing. Yeah. Uh, so there's a political aspect to it that. That's, that that's is, how Bill wrote it. Yeah. And it's kind Bill of striking, very, you know, you know, the communists and the, and the capitalists. And then the other thing is that, that movie the alien three that actually got made kind of drags but uh, i i kind of have ptsd from reading your book it was very fast paced and and uh it, it was an intense experience reading it and i was thinking god that would have made a great movie and i actually found myself wishing that they would take the original script and your novelization and make that movie now you know, it would be great if they did it now, even though I guess Lance Henriksen might be a bit old for to play Bishop at this point, and maybe Michael Bian is a little older than Hicks should be. But it would really be great to, to, to see that filmed. Yeah, well, I had to see it in my head because I, I've done, you know, a number of novelizations. And when you start out, you don't have any materials usually to, to look at. Uh, and then it you know, af after a while, uh, you can get the studio to send you, you know, production stills or pictures of people in their, you know, in wardrobe uh, or models of the set, things like that to give you some feeling of what things look like, how people are, you know, and maybe even what they sound like a little. But um, in this, there was, there would never be any production stills or you know schematics to look at there would be no photographs of the you know of the actors in in general wardrobe or uniform one of the things that i did was i went out and i bought that that book about the uh uh the marines it's it's got all the all their weaponry and everything and because you know i'm i'm old and i have chemo brain i'm drawing a blank on the title but it was very useful because I wanted to see um, to, to see the weaponry and to know uh, to have a reference so that I you know I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't come up with some kind of gun or you know detector that was obviously not you know not suited to how they were so that gave me a very good idea of uh, of what things looked like. But also, Bill wrote visually, you know, in the script, he, um, he didn't take a lot of time to describe things, but he was very good at, you know, at drawing a, a, a sketch in a few words. And so I, you know, I wrote what I saw. How about dialogue? Did you did you pretty much use the dialogue that he had written or did you make changes there? Um, I did make some changes to dialogue. I added stuff and, uh, but I didn't, I didn't delete anything. All of the, all of Bill's, you know, dialogue that he wrote is in there. Um, I may have, have, you know, added some things to it because spoken speech, when you read it, can sound weird. I'll give you an example. Actually, it's from Bill, uh, and he uh, he had uh, one of the second the second uh, not his second novel was serialized in Asimov's science fiction magazine, and Gardner called him up. Gardner does well was the editor at the time, and he called him up and he said, "I have to make a little change to uh, one of your lines of dialogue," and uh, Bill said, "Oh." And he said, yeah, he said, you have a character, you know, it's like they're hanging around the house. And, and he says, oh, there's some fruit and shit, in the, fruit and cheese and shit in the freezer or in the refrigerator. And uh, when you see that on the page, you know, it doesn't come off like it does when you're just, you know, talking, when you're saying it. I can tell you there's fruit and cheese and shit in the refrigerator. But if you read that on the page, it looks like, you know, you're keeping, you're keeping copper lifts in there, too. 
So, um, so Gardner just changed it to stuff or something like that, or maybe fruit and cheese and whatever. I don't know. But um, so I had to do a few things like that, or I had to uh, preface some things, or uh, you know. Anyway, they they say more words in the book than they do in the script, and uh, uh, and that's really why because um, when you read speech that's meant to be spoken, it's entirely different than reading dialogue that's written down in a book. This is what your second novelization. The other one was Alita: Battle Angel. Oh, I've written I've written several novelizations. I wrote the novelization to a movie called Cellular, with oh. that was my first novelization I did for Black Library. Um, it was a Kim Basinger movie where she literally phoned it in. She's you know she's kept hostage somewhere, and she uh, she because she's a science teacher, she manages to get a phone connection, and she connects with the first cellular phone that she can you know connect with. And uh, then there was, oh, there was Jason X, and that was a hoot. Jason and Outer, you know, Jason Voorhees, Friday the 13th. Right. And um, when I wrote that novelist, the movie had already been out for years. In fact, it was available on DVD. And I remember I went and I got it. Yeah, I got the one with all the features about people talking about how they wrote it and what they did and everything. And Jason X as a movie is really a hoot. It really is. It has a sense of humor about itself. It doesn't take itself too seriously. It provides all the gore and the horrible deaths and everything. But it's, you know, it's really kind of a, you know, a fun adventure, if you can call, you know, people, you know, screaming, running, screaming for their lives uh, and, and trying not to, you know, get spaced uh, fun. But uh, I had a ball with that. But in the uh, novelization, just as it was cellular, that was also for Black Library. And the studio wanted every book to be 95,000 words because they liked the way the text looked and the thickness of the book with 95,000 words. So the text was right size and the book was the right thickness. These are the people who probably you know, order a yard of books for their offices, you know. That's so funny. And, well, it, it was funny. And uh, so I had to put things in to make the word count. So I gave, you know, I gave everybody a backstory. There's uh, a couple who, you know, it's like you see them for maybe a minute total. They have maybe a minute total of screen time and they get killed after they have sex, of course. Because, you know, that's what happens to you in Friday the 13th movies. And um, so I gave both of them incredible backstory. Why, where they'd come from and why they were so attracted to each other. What he saw in her and what she saw in him. And also that, you know, when she opened the door, when he was leaving her room after having sex, he could get killed by the resurrected Jason Voorhees. And See? I did that with all kinds of things. I gave the, uh, uh, there was a soul, there was a, a, you know, a group of soldiers and they had backstories and I had a great time actually. It sounds like a blast. So it in was, doing- It was so much fun. Yeah, have you written screenplays? No, no, does I this, haven't. Does this make you feel tempted to write screenplays? No, no, actually it doesn't. I. I've just been a, I guess maybe I've been a prose writer for too long. Uh, you know, I, I suppose if someone really wanted me to, to, to write one and they really wanted me to write one bad enough that they were willing to pay more money for it, then I would give it a try, you know. Actually, you know, I take that back. I did... I did sort of a treatment once for um, for people who wanted to make a movie out of the power and the passion of vampire story of mine, and um, they wanted to they wanted to make a whole movie with you know lots of story to it, and uh, I tried writing a treatment, and it 
maybe because they weren't actually paying up front for the treatment that uh, it didn't really hold my interest. But I really felt like, you know, it's like, here, you take the movie and you make the movie and I'll just be over here writing source material. So I how's the, how's I the treatment different from, oh, go ahead. Well, treatment is just, you know, you, you basically give, a, you know, you tell the story. Kind of an outline. But, yeah, yeah, except you write it in a, in a kind of a narrative fashion. It's not very detailed, you know. It's like you won't have things like when he gets up, he's, he looks for his keys and finds them. Not, you won't detail how all the things that he does when he's looking for his keys, for example, just for example. But um, I did have a movie made. A TV movie was made using um, Pretty Boy Crossover, my story Pretty Boy Crossover, as source material. Now, the finished product, bears absolutely no resemblance to Pretty Boy Crossover, but they give me a lovely credit right up front, you know, it's like I get a whole screen card to myself, and uh, uh, they didn't shame me, and they paid for the privilege of using my ideas and, and you know, how I had it to tell a story of their own, and, you know, it's like I find no fault with, with people who are willing to to do that as opposed to uh, various uh, rip-offs that I've seen happen, not just of me, but of many writers over the years. Yeah, it seems to me that, um, I mean, there's such a, a difference in um, writing for the screen and writing a novel. And yeah. novel, novels are always changed or even short stories tend to be changed radically when they're adapted you know you, well you once again it, it. Huh? It, it's one of those things where uh you couldn't adapt a book you know scene for scene character for character word for word of dialogue uh from a book or a story to a, a movie or even a, a tv episode because what works in the book, what makes it work as prose, won't necessarily make it work as, you know, as something that people watch in front of them. And it would be uh, much longer, right? You'd have to do a mini series or something. Well, it's, um, well, there are lots of, of books that are, you know, sort of successfully done in one movie. And uh, although, how successful they are, I think, is in the eye of the, of the beholder. But um, the, the two, they're two different media, you know, and one has to be adapted to fit the other. And so when it's like I said, what you can do on screen in one second with lighting, background music, and a facial expression takes a thousand words on the page. And you have to do the thousand words without slowing up the, you know, the action. The, the, the movie has to, you know, the story has to keep going. You have to fit all this in without stopping to talk about it. You know, the, this is, has to be in the course of the action. And it's, it's something that, you know, that I was very conscious of when I was writing Alien 3 because uh, uh, action that kind of action scene isn't something that I've done a whole lot of. So it was, um, it was something that I really had to teach myself how to do. And, uh, uh, you know, I've had, well, some people will tell you that, you know, I fell down, I fell on my face miserably. And other people will say, oh, wow, it was action packed. It was, you know, rattled right along. So, um, you know, once again, it's, uh, it's it's an individual thing. Uh, also, there are people who are just absolutely dedicated to Aliens uh, as it exists as a franchise now. And this doesn't, of course, fit the canon or the Bible or any anything that's been established as, you know, the Aliens franchise. So um, there are people who, who dislike the book for that reason. And that's their privilege, too. I'm glad we live in a country where, you know, the secret police don't come and take you away for your opinions. Have you so received, far? 
Yeah. Have you received any con any contact? Have you been contacted at all by any of the people involved with the Alien Three movie uh, re responding to your treatment of it? Oh hell no! Um, they're probably unaware of it. <laughs> uh, how, how about the the, net and the negative comments you've received from the book from from Alien fans? What did, did they seem to be uh, most uh, disturbed about? Um, well, let's see. I think I think most of the ones who don't like it don't like it because it's not like it doesn't conform to you know the canon as as it has been established and uh it's it's not what they're used to it's not what they were expecting and i'm not saying anything bad about them for that you know it's like when you are you know invested in, in you know a book a series of books or you know like this you, you get to feeling very territorial about it you know and uh, you, you feel possessive and when someone comes in and does something uh, that 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 doesn't fit you you know you may react to it as something novel or you may feel that it really just doesn't work and uh, um, and you know either either is okay at the end of the day I'm you know I'm at peace with what I did I did the very best possible job that I could. And uh, uh, so far, Bill hasn't taken a hit out on me. So I guess he's okay with it. And, uh, um, and that's really all, you know, it's like you, you do your best work, you put it out there and, uh, and you hope people like it. Most of the response that I've had, the direct response that I've had to it has been very good. Yeah, yeah, you got a lot of five star re reviews on uh, on Amazon. Yeah. I know. Uh, well, I got I got reviews from from people. Some people had never heard of me before, and uh, and I was delighted. It's also had a little. It's given my other my original work a boost, actually, and it's also helped my my other my novelization of Alita and the uh, and the tie-ins. I did the, the prequel story for Alita. And I did, uh, in collaboration with Paul Dini, I did Mad Love, you know, Harley Quinn. And uh, uh, all of those were, you know, I think they all got a little boost from people who reacted favorably to what I'd written. But as I said, also my own work, my own work has, um, has uh, it has helped. I'm wondering, when you did the work on Alita, did you have any contact with our homeboy, Robert Rodriguez? Not him, but the studio was in touch a lot, and uh, and uh, they wanted what they said to me was, please don't do a slavish adaptation, you know, point for point with the script. What we want for the novelization is we're really looking for a novel. We want you to write a novel, and so I wrote a novel. And they were very, very pleased. I remember talking to uh, one of the people uh, at the studio who had told me this, and I gave him a, a quick sketch of a, a scene that I'd written in the beginning when uh, in, in the movie, uh, a woman takes a taxi home from work late at night, and she's, uh, she's at her front door and she gets killed by the, one of the marauding monsters. And in the book, of course, you know, uh, it would not be much of a story if I just said that. So I had the, you know, the taxi driver picked her up and, you know, times are tough all over and she looks like she can't afford the ride. And he actually gives some of the fare back to her and he drives away feeling you know, no good deed is ever wasted. And un unknown to him, of course, right after that, she gets killed. And I said, is that okay? And they said, yes, yeah, do, do the things like that. So I did things like that. Uh, they were very uh, supportive actually. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember that they, that they asked for any changes whatsoever. Uh, my editor, of course, had me, had me fix things 
But uh, my editor on that book was, her name is Ella Chappelle. And she was, uh, she was like an editing prodigy, you know? She was very young, but she was like some, she was like someone who had years and years of editing experience. She's very knowledgeable and very, very uh, sharp-eyed. But, uh, and of course she helped a great deal. And she was my editor on the uh, Mad Love book as well. And uh, of course on the uh, prequel Alita, which didn't have Alita in it. But um, all told uh, the Alita people were, they were very supportive. They did ask for, you know, they did eliminate some things in the prequel that I had introduced technology that didn't exist. And uh, it wasn't a problem. The technology could be lifted out without, you know, without it affecting the heart of the story. So, you know, it's like, that was no big deal. And uh, um, oh, it was, I had a great time, all told. <laughs> Apparently, there's going to be a sequel to Alita. Are you? Have you had any oh, involvement in that? I didn't know that, but um, a lot of uh, Alita fans, fans of the movie, are uh, are in touch with me, especially on Twitter, and they all really love the novelization, and they've all been agitating for a sequel to Alita, and for you know, I hadn't heard whether there was going to be one or not, but you know, they're all very very much in favor of that you know and they've been campaigning for it so, what i'd heard was that james cameron and and robert rodriguez would both like to to do a sequel no oh, i well, hey it's fine by me and i I'd, I'd be even happier if they uh if they okayed me for for the novelization uh the alita uh novelization in fact uh won an award it was my first scribe award from the um International Writers of Novelizations and Tie-Ins. And uh, it's quite a beautiful award. And I was, you know, I was floored when I was uh, nominated and I was even happier to find out that I'd won. And, it sounds uh, like it was a pretty exceptional, I mean, the fact that you sort of filled it in so much and made it into a real novel uh, is probably a bit different from the typical novelization, right? Well, it's, a, it's a bit different in that I had, I had more proactive studio support than you usually get. You know, it's like the studio, they do movies and, uh, and the novelizations are, you know, it's like something that they license, you know, but they're not, they're not real involved in it. And, uh, um, and they don't care as long as something bad doesn't happen, you know. How and, do they see and, it? Do they, do they see it as just a, a sort of another way to promote the film? You know, I have no idea and I can't really speak for anyone. The only, the only thing I'm, I'm saying, you know, is like they, they may not be aware of it or they may be aware of it, but they do movies is, I know how busy I am, you know, and I know just how much work it takes to, you know, to, to bring a movie into being. So I imagine with all of the stuff that they have to think about, plus the, um, the special effects that have to be added afterwards or, or, you know, or repaired or, um, and then there are the changes to the script and maybe scenes that need to be reshot. Uh, they really don't need to be, to have to think about me. I just so, remembered the, the first novelization I ever read was Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Do you know who wrote that? No. It was Theodore Sturgeon. <laughs> that seems uh, so unusual to me. I mean, I, uh, he just, he didn't really seem like the exact fit for Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, but it was really a, a, a very good novelization. Yeah, um, you know, it, well, he probably had fun. You know, the, oh, yeah. the, the, um, the premise probably captured his imagination. He probably enjoyed watching the show. And uh, when he was asked to do a novelization, uh, he was only too happy. I think the novelization was actually better than the film in that case. I, um, <laughs> uh, it wasn't, you know, just a terrific movie, though. I, actually, I have a copy of it. I, 
I have a sort of nostalgia for that film, but it, it wasn't necessarily, you know, a, a classic or a work of art. <clears throat> so what's oh, next? Like, what do, what they, do you what do you have on your agenda? Um, well, right now I'm waiting to hear if um, I'm going to be, uh, you know, writing another tie-in or novelization or something. And uh, um, it, I'm still waiting to hear. And in the meantime, I'm, you know, working on my own things. I'm, you know, working on my sushi novel. And I've, uh, uh, I've got this fantasy thing that, uh, that I'm developing as a novel. And uh, Did um, you say sushi novel? I, I call it the sushi novel because it is based on uh, my story, The Girl Thing Who Went Out for Sushi which in 2013 won Hugo for best novelette. I and I will never, ever let anyone forget it. But uh, the novelette isn't part of, you know, the, the subsequent novel. The novel takes place about a, a hundred years after what happens in, uh, in Girl Thing. So, uh, um, and it's hard science. It's, it's, you know, set in the solar system with people who aren't always in standard human form. And uh, uh, boy, I had to learn a lot of science. I had to learn a lot of, you know, space science. And then I had to learn a lot of biology and, you know, and, uh, and figure out how, how much hand waving I could get away with, you know. Did you typically have several things going at once? Yeah, I do. I do because uh, when one thing pales or you know gets kind of old for me, and I need to think about something else, I will simply switch over to the other project or one of the other projects. And uh, um, I always try to leave room for uh, a possible short fiction thing because uh, uh, I still get asked for those every so often. Uh, yeah, like could, for the magazines okay. or anthologies or uh and usually anthologies usually anthologies if i could get away actually with writing short fiction uh shortish fiction i think forever and and making a living that way i would but uh it's uh so far it no one's been able to do that uh all i need is like a couple of good movie options and I'm <laughs> right and, and I can write short stories for a while but also um, um, at my back I always hear Time's Winged Chariot hurrying near and uh, I of course I've become more conscious of that not simply because I'm older but because I'm you know so far I'm I'm into five years of borrowed time uh, my my original departure date was set to the end of 2016. Yeah, and... I, I don't think you're going anywhere. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I was on a panel with with Joe Hill, and uh, and he knew that I that I had you know that I had terminal cancer and my you know the prognosis was terminal at the time that I met him. It was, and then I came back, and you know things had changed. And uh, and he said, folks, she's going to bury us all. I mean, and, we all have uh, a terminal prognosis, right? Oh, yeah. That's that's, you know, that's <laughs> called, life. you know, no one gets out of here alive. And uh, uh, but I've become very uh, kind of relaxed about it, you know, possibly because it just never takes. You yep. know, I've been dead twice and it didn't take it didn't take either time. And I'm, uh, and now I've, you know, I've been around for a while. So there's a lot less sand in the top of the hourglass as there is in the bottom, of course. But nobody, you still don't know how much there is. Yeah. Everybody in my mother's family died by the age of 70. And my mother lived to be 92. They died because they didn't take care of themselves or see a doctor. My mother, you know, my mother was more conscientious. She died at 92. And, uh, and it was, uh, 
death finally got her to slow down, you know, and it's, I, I come to see it as, as just, you know, you know, I could walk out in the street and uh, I, I could go, go to the store for, you know, run an errand to the store and come back and some bitch would have dropped a house on my house, <laughs> feel my sh you know. You know, I and, know a guy uh, who had a, a stage four renal cancer with a prognosis of maybe two years. And mm -hmm. it's like, what, 15 years later and he's still going strong. And he well, actually um, had one of the experimental treatments, but uh, you know, uh, cancer is not necessarily a death sentence anymore. No, no. And uh, even the ones that, that used to be like sure things, you know, aren't quite as sure as they used to be. People are living longer and better and healthier. And I figure if I can just last long enough for the, uh, the viral therapy to be per perfected, then, uh, then I've got a shot, you know, I've got a shot at, at getting cured, you know. But, you know, it's, what we do is we put off the inevitable. That's the whole point of life, is to put off the inevitable. So, um, you know, you just hang in. Well, one thing that's inevitable is reaching the end of our hour, which we seem to yep. have done. And uh, I really hope that you'll come back and talk to us again. I will come back and talk to you anytime you want me to, John. Right on. We love these conversations. This has been fun. Yeah, I love you guys. You know, you're fun. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.